I just love the picture uh, on the cover of this module, this cute chocolate lab. Um, this module is Diet for Life, How to Feed Your Dog to Live Forever. Obviously, the answer is not going to be cheeseburgers, however much he wants it. Okay, so in this module, we are going to jump right into understanding the role diet plays in your dog's health. Because it's fed every day, several times a day, dog food is probably the number one most influential factor in your dog's health. I feel that by changing the diets of my dogs, it brought the biggest change to their own health. I think diet was the number one thing that brought the biggest change. So dogs like us need real food to thrive. Remembering back to that question, what is natural for dogs? For thousands of years, natural meant uh, basically eating what we eat. Fresh animal muscle, protein, bone broth, and organ meat. Also, dogs were probably tossed raw bones quite often. Eggs and raw milk, especially herding breeds. I really feel like goat milk and cow's milk can be a big part of a healthful diet for dogs whose ancestry probably involved herding uh, sheep and goats and cattle. Berries and various fruits, leafy greens, other starchy vegetables, and then prepared grains and prepared seeds. And when I say prepared, I'm meaning um, not raw off the plant, so not going out and chewing um, the grain heads off of an oat stalk, but more the foods that humans were preparing and then sharing with dogs. So those would be cooked grains, they might be fermented grains, and the nuts and seeds were probably ground uh, or soaked or fermented. So remembering prior to 1860 and good old James Spratt who invented um, the first dog wafer, he actually invented it because uh, he was watching dogs on the shore eating the hardtack biscuits that a bunch of sailors had thrown out after they got back uh, from a voyage. And he thought to himself, what a, what a great idea, you know, I'm going to make the hardtack for dogs. And if you think about it, that's basically what we're still feeding them today. He came up with the idea of a patented meat fibrine dog cake. That's what he called it. Catchy name. And he marketed it to the wealthy um, instead of feeding your dog table scraps or bits of meat. This basically started a new model for feeding dogs, one uh, that eventually evolved into commercial pet diets. So commercial pet diets are basically like dog hardtack. That's a really good way to think of it because it's uh, grain-based, it's uh, shelf-stable, can stay on a shelf for a long time without going bad, just like hardtack at sea, and had vitamins and minerals added to it. To fortify it. And then as agriculture became more industrialized, commercial pet food was a great way to use up cheap grain commodities, so the leftovers. So looking uh, closer now at what diet options are available for our dogs today. Okay, so the first is the worst. It's ultra processed pet food. And to me, this picture looks like trick cereal or the, the sugary cereals that are marketed to kids. Um, it's maybe appealing to the eye. There's a lot of colors in there. If you think about it, the colors are really reflecting natural foods created artificially. So you see like the red from berries and the purple uh, from fruits and the green um, from vegetables, and then the orange-brown colors, which could be meat. So our standard American dog diet, or SADD, is sad indeed. It, most dogs eat commercial, ultra-processed dog kibble. I'm not really gonna go into canned food here because the majority of people feed kibble. It's the most cost-effective 
and the can falls into a semi-processed category. It still has thickeners and fillers added, um, but we're not going to talk about that much today. These foods, these ultra-processed pet foods, are generally dyed in ex uh, extruded puffs of cornmeal. So they're incredibly high in mycotoxins because they are corn-based. The ingredients are broken down from the whole form and infused with sugar, fat, thickeners, colorants, glazes, palatants to make them edible and to last longer. Palatants can include um, ingredients like cadaverine and putrescine, which are made of exactly what they sound like. Super disgusting. Ultra processed food uh, has been altered by heat several times during processing. The average for most kibble is four high heat processing sessions before it's finished. Every time it's uh, exposed to the high heat, it causes a loss of naturally occurring vitamins and minerals so that they have to be added back in synthetically afterwards. Heating and processing also produces something called advanced glycation end products or AGEs. These are toxic substances that have been linked to disease and cancer in humans. And unfortunately, dog food is really high in it. Oh, those are my dogs barking right now. So next on the list, we have processed pet food, and I'm calling this good. Processed pet food is a little bit better. This category includes canned foods and less processed kibbles. It's also heat processed, but less so, less nutrient loss, uh, but they still need synthetic vitamins and minerals added back in in order to be nutritionally adequate. This type of food contains more natural preservatives like vitamin E, rosemary, antioxidants, things like that. It may be grain free and it may contain legumes as an alternative, which are beans, chickpeas. These are really difficult for dogs to digest and they contain naturally occurring anti-nutrients. So I'm not a big fan of legume based grain free dog foods. They may have alternative grains like rice, barley, oats added to them, sometimes quinoa, but they're still very high in starch, which essentially is a sugar. And a natural, natural dog diet should be high in protein and fat and lower in starch. Remember back to their um, ancestry, starch wasn't something that was largely available to dogs even when they were cohabitating with humans. These processed pet foods are still often full of factory farmed meats and therefore can have high levels of glyphosate and pesticide residues. They may have added chunks or morsels. Sometimes you'll see little bits of green um, or bits of meat in there. And that's kind of like adding a pinch of broccoli sprouts to your Big Mac and fries. It's really not upgrading the nutritional level of the food that much. So these are in a mid category. They're a little bit better than the ultra processed food, but still not great. In the next category, we have unprocessed pet food. These are made with fresh raw ingredients blended together and freeze dried or high heat pasteurized in order to preserve them. They are low heat or no heat processed once, and they could also be dehydrated foods. So because they're not heat processed multiple times, there's less degradation of the naturally occurring vitamins and minerals. These also have a lower or non-existent level of AGEs. Generally, they have better quality ingredients, closer to human grade, Good choices um, for organic foods. You'll often find these type of foods are organic or natural. You'll often find that they have a lot of options for dogs with allergies and sensitivities. And um, they're also very convenient to feed. So if you're not ready to take the next step, which is a homemade diet, this 
is a really great compromise. And this is something I keep on hand for when I'm in a hurry and I have a busy day, when I haven't prepared meals ahead of time for the dogs, or when I'm traveling, going on vacation, and I have someone else caring for them for me. And then finally, this is the final category. We have homemade pet food, and I'm gonna call this the best. This is what it sounds like. It is a homemade table scraps diet. It can be gently cooked, uh, poached meats and vegetables, or it can be partially raw, partially cooked. It can also be fully raw. This type of diet has a lot of naturally occurring vitamins and minerals. It is best assimilated by the body because they're coming from real food. This type of diet is also naturally high in antioxidants and polyphenols, which are really important for cellular health. This type of diet is the most supportive of the microbiome. It reduces inflammation in the body. It enhances energy and decreases the incidence of cancer when fed long-term. And homemade diets contain more variety. So I feel like they're better for picky eaters and dogs with allergies and sensitivities. I find that this way of cooking is fun. I find that my dogs wind up eating a lot of what we're eating. I kind of save the leftovers for them and they really are eating a lot of table scraps. So here's a list of the ingredients that I recommend that you avoid in dog food. You can check the food that you're feeding now. And if you go out shopping looking for a different type of dog food, you can take this with you. I'll attach it as a PDF with this course. But basically, any type of meal, corn gluten meal, poultry meal, you want to avoid. Peanuts and peanut hulls are a source of significant mycotoxins. You want to avoid dyes and colors. For example, red number 40, if you remember the ultra processed pet food, we saw the bright colors that look like trick cereal. It's the kind of stuff you want to avoid. You want to avoid propylene gly glycol, any sort of soy oil, flour, meal, hulls, basically any soy products. We also want to avoid um, the oxide and sulfate forms of minerals, uh, for example, zinc oxide or copper sulfate. Avoiding animal byproducts, avoiding BHA, BHT, and also, also ethoxyquin as synthetic preservatives. And then finally, avoiding sodium selenite, which is a synthetic form of selenium. Okay, so here are some action steps that you can take starting today. You can do this today with whatever food you're feeding to improve your dog's diet. So a dry kibble diet soaks up the digestive juices in the dog's stomach and it leaches mineral reserves. It can also cause indigestion and be a cause of chronic grass eating when your dog goes out and grazes like a little cow on grass. Every time you go outside, this could be why. You wanna just stop feeding dry food. So I'm not saying stop feeding kibble, I'm saying stop feeding the kibble dry. So you moisten whatever your food, whatever food you're feeding now, whatever your dog is eating now, you're going to moisten it. And you can use bone broth, Again, I'm attaching a PDF for a really easy recipe for bone broth. I suggest you just sit, start saving all of your bone scraps from whatever meats you may be eating, your family's already eating, uh, and turning them into a really easy bone broth that is rich in amino acids and collagen for your dog. You can also moisten it with raw milk or organic grass-fed milk. I don't recommend um, pasteurized homogenized milk. It's really hard for the body to assimilate. It's ultra processed. That's the kind of food we're trying to step away from. But uh, especially the herding breeds, I highly recommend dairy for them as a protein source. You can also moisten it with just plain filtered water, warm water, or an herbal infusion. And herbal infusions, again, I'll attach as a PDF they are certain combinations that can be used to boost mineral reserves or to combat allergies or target specific ailments. And all you do is wet the food 
with whatever you're going to use as your liquid and then let it soak for five to 10 minutes. Easy and first step that you can take that'll make a big difference for your dog. The next step to go a step further would be to add uh, what I call live food toppers. So live food toppers are your table scraps. It's whatever you're eating. It can be fruits, vegetables, gently cooked vegetables, meat scraps, herbs, whatever you're eating, whatever healthy people foods you're eating. So this isn't going to include macaroni and cheese or Cheez-Its or potato chips. You also don't wanna feed raisins, grapes, cocoa, chocolate, or onions to your dog. But most other foods that are what we consider healthy and whole foods are very beneficial for your dog to eat. So you start by simply feeding three quarters of your normal, normal dog food portion, whatever you're already feeding, it, it doesn't matter, even if it's the ultra processed food. And then you're gonna top that or add a quarter portion of live food. So often for most medium to large size dogs, this looks like um, three quarters to a cup of dog kibble and then one quarter to half a cup of live foods. And when you're starting out, you can even add less, especially if your dog has sensitive digestion. You may start with a tablespoon or a couple tablespoons of chopped carrots, um, whatever vegetables you're eating. If your dog is on the pudgy side, you can replace a quarter of the food. So you actually remove one quarter of the kibble and replace it with fruits and vegetables and meat scraps. And if your dog is on the lean side and you want him to gain weight, then you add the quarter in addition. So you're upping the amount of food that he's getting by adding the amount to it. Action step number three is moving forward in the big plan. What kind of diet are you gonna feed your dog? So deciding that if time is an issue, if you really don't have the time to prepare a homemade meal, then consider the unprocessed pet foods, the dehydrated, the freeze dried, low in synthetic vitamins. Those foods are excellent. You usually moisten them before feeding and they're a wonderful compromise to the ultra processed foods. If cost is an issue, I recommend considering a homemade diet. I find that buying the unprocessed pet foods is more expensive than buying the same ingredients myself and making it in large batches at home. And then finally, if your dog has a serious health concern, in Chipper's case, he was dealing with cancer, I recommend a homemade, partially raw, or even a fully raw diet. That's where we're going to with Chipper now, he's into the fully raw zone and it really has made a tremendous difference in his health. It's given him his life back. And it's also, I've seen tremendous benefits for the puppy who was suffering with colitis that's gone. It's a thing of the past. She has normal, healthy digestion now. And my dog, Radar, with the chronic yeast and ear infections, it's no longer an issue. It's not something we're dealing with anymore. So here are some examples of live food toppers. What can you add to the food they're already receiving? So you see there's um, longevity vegetables, the forever fruits, the powerful proteins, and some uh, ways to build gut health. These are mostly prebiotic foods that feed the good bacteria living in the microbiome. Adding live food toppers instantly improves the nutrition of whatever you're already feeding. The most dramatic ads, in my opinion, would be berries because they're so protective against oxidative damage caused by mycotoxins. Carrots are great. They remove endotoxins from the gut. Broccoli sprouts, you can buy them in the grocery store. It's also super easy to sprout them yourself at home. They inhibit AGE-induced inflammation. Turmeric and ginger are also amazing. Turmeric is something I give to my dogs daily in the form of turmeric paste, which I'll be sharing in the next module. It helps to mitigate damage caused by mycotoxins. And then finally, brewing some green tea can reduce DNA damage. 
So these are some of the most powerful additives that you can give to whatever food you're already feeding to instantly improve the nutrition that your dog is receiving and kind of mitigate the negative effects that the additives in those foods have. So here's the problem I have with synthetic vitamins. I've mentioned it a couple times now, the synthetic added vitamins. First is that the food is made dead and that's why the synthetic vitamins have to be added in the first place. Synthetic vitamins are lab made and added back in because they were lost from the food. So they're completely artificially made. I find that they're hard for the body to utilize and research has shown that synthetic nutrients are mostly ineffective at preventing disease anyways. Folate is a good example of, uh, folate and folic acid is a good example of this. So folate is the natural form of vitamin B9 while folic acid is the synthetic version. And in order for the body to convert folic acid into folate, additional levels of vitamin C, vitamin B12, and niacin are required. So folic acid kind of takes a seat on the vitamin mineral bus that's driving around the body so that when folate actually arrives, the body doesn't use it thinking that the seat has already been taken up. Its, its needs are already fulfilled. So folate depletion can actually occur while being fed a diet that's high in folic acid. So that's just one example of how synthetic vitamins can cause trouble. Synthetic vitamins are also high, um, high levels usually, and they can build up to even higher levels in the body because it's harder for the body to recognize and utilize these forms. You don't find such high levels of vitamins in whole foods and the body has a better time assimilating them. So less is needed and the body can do more with it if it's in a natural form. A lot of processed dog food companies, commercial pet food companies, and some veterinarians would have you think that your dog possibly, cannot possibly thrive without adding in these synthetic vitamins and minerals. It's a little silly if you think about it because not every human on the planet takes synthetic vitamins and minerals and we're thriving. Many of us are thriving. So why would your dog need to have synthetic vitamins and minerals? Why does he have to have a kibble-based diet? I really started to question this. And then to drawing on my knowledge of nutrition, looking into food sources of vitamin minerals. So here on this page, you can just see some of the many different examples of foods that are high in different vitamins and minerals. And many of these are repeats. But for example, you can look in and see that vitamin A is found in liver, eggs, sardines, cod liver oil. Calcium is found in yogurt, raw milk, cheese, sardines, salmon, collards, kale, spinach, broccoli. Um, copper is found in liver, oysters, sunflower seeds. The B vitamins are found in liver, trout, tuna, eggs, turkey, sunflower seeds, brown rice, spinach. You've heard me say liver several times already. Iodine, so important to the thyroid gland, is found in seaweed, scallops, cod, shrimp, a lot of seafood. And then vitamin D, also important for immune health. Salmon, sardines, cod liver oil, mushrooms, egg yolk, raw milk, shrimp. So nature provides vitamins and minerals in abundance. There's no reason to feel like your dog is gonna be deficient as long as you have the knowledge of how to build a balanced diet. So these are my superfoods for vitamins and minerals. These are the ones that were repeated several times in the previous section. Liver, something that the dogs get daily. Sunflower seeds are an amazing source of vitamin E. Eggs have an amazing array of vitamins and minerals in them. Sardines are wonderful. Leafy greens, I tend to feed leafy greens cooked to the dogs. And then seaweeds are a great source of iodine in very small amounts, not feeding too much at once. Here I'm showing two examples of minimally processed dog food with live food toppers. So this is kind of a compromise meal if you don't want to do the fully homemade diet. And these are shown for a 60 pound dog. The first one is a turkey meal. 
and it has two cups of Sojo's turkey formula that is a dehydrated or freeze-dried, I can't remember which, formula that is already balanced. Three cups warm water to rehydrate that, and then adding a third of a pound of brown turkey that can be raw or cooked, an eighth of a cup chopped steamed broccoli, and an eighth of a cup of blueberries, and that's it. That is an amazing meal. The Sojo's on its own is complete. You don't have to add in. The rest are considered live food toppers, so bonus foods to the meal. And the second example shows a beef meal, it's two cups of Nature's Diet Beef Superfood. This is another freeze-dried complete food. And then adding one and a half cups of an herbal infusion, half a cup ground beef that could be raw or cooked, one fourth of a cup steamed asparagus and a tablespoon of cranberries, usually raw. So again, adding polyphenols to the food, adding in antioxidants, adding in foods that are gonna combat oxidative stress in, the, stress in the body and using a minimally processed food as the base. In this example, this is a fully homemade beef dinner with naturally occurring vitamins and minerals. So nothing synthetic is added and the nutritional requirements are being provided in this meal. And it's beef, beef liver, Brussels sprouts, spinach, sunflower seeds, hemp seeds, sardines, cod liver oil, kelp powder, and Brazil nuts. So it's just maybe things you're already eating if you're on a healthy diet and maybe some things to add to your shopping list, but it's, it's not hard. I find it's a lot of fun to make these diets. So here's an example of Chipper's daily diet. This is my guy who is living with lymphoma and thriving. He is a 60 pound dog and he gets one and a half pounds ground turkey, a quarter of a pound of chicken liver, a fourth of a cup blueberries, chopped apples. It can really be any fruits or vegetables that I have on hand. A fourth of a cup steamed sweet potato and carrots. Again, I mix it up. It can be different vegetables, different days. A tablespoon of sunflower seeds, one Brazil nut, a teaspoon of cow liver oil, an eighth of a teaspoon, sometimes a sixteenth of a teaspoon of kelp, one oyster, one canned oyster for zinc, copper, and one can of sardines most days. And this is divided into two meals. When he was underweight and struggling with the symptoms of cancer, he also got a snack midday of raw milk and sardines to boost his weight, just help him get through that. And here's Radar and Roxy. They're on the same diet uh, right now. And just for the ease of feeding and the economics of feeding, they are getting two cups of Gentle Giants chicken formula food, which is um, a kibble. It is a very low processed kibble. And they're getting, in addition to that, one cup of bone broth, half of a cup of beef liver or ground turkey, whatever meat scraps I have. They get a quarter cup squash or beets or pumpkin or broccoli and a quarter cup blackberries, pears, blueberries, cranberries. It can be chopped apples, whatever fruit I have on hand and a teaspoon of turmeric paste. And again, this is divided into two meals. So talking about eating to live, you're going to make changes as slowly as possible to your dog's diet. If you do it too fast, I made this mistake with Chipper, uh, he was in dire straits. So I, I made very dramatic changes in a short amount of time because he was so not well. But we went through some poop weirdness because I made the changes so fast. And I can tell you that pumpkin, a dollop of 100% pure canned pumpkin, like what you use to make pumpkin pies, helps tremendously to firm up loose stools and can help with dietary transition. Uh, I recommend giving about a teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight. And it's also a good idea as you're making transitions with diet to monitor poop daily. So actually go out with your dog uh, and watch and see what the consistency is of their bowel movements. Is it too loose? Are they having a hard time? Did they not go to the bathroom one day? You can also add slippery elm powder. It's easy to find at an herbal store or a health food store. And I like to mix that with water. It works wonders if you've transitioned too fast. And again, you have loose bowels. 
I recommend giving one teaspoon to half a cup of water, making like a tea and then wetting their food with that. It's very soothing to the GI tract. So you're going to start out giving about 75% of his regular diet and then 25% of whatever the better diet is. Let's say you're feeding ultra processed food and you want to transition to a freeze dried food. So you're going to give 75% of the ultra processed kibble he's already getting and then start replacing that with 25% of the freeze dried. And then after a week or two, you're going to give 30% of the regular ultra processed kibble maybe 60% of the better diet, and then add in 10% of the live food toppers. And then finally, I can see my screen is kind of covering this last image, but you're gonna be giving 100% of the better diet, so the freeze dried food, and then 10% of the live food toppers. And if you're transitioning to a fully homemade or fully raw diet, then at this point, you'll just be feeding 100% fully homemade or raw, and the live food toppers are null and void because they're already part of the food you're feeding. Here I'm going to go into a minute um, about time-restricted feeding strategies or your dog's eating window. So you can very positively affect your dog's metabolism and overall well-being by simply feeding all of his daily calories in a defined period of time. When you eat is just as important as what you eat. And these are the two most important factors that dictate a dog's lifespan and health span. So there's different strategies for time-restricted feeding, but the basic rule is there's no more all-you-can-eat buffet, no more setting down a bowl of food all day, all night, so the dog can eat whenever he feels like it. That tends to encourage picky eating. It can develop uh, into obesity. It can develop into gastrointestinal problems in dogs. Dogs are not ruminants. They're not grazers. They're not little goats and cows. They're not meant to be grazing at food all day. They're carnivores slash herbivores, and they've coexisted with humans who we also don't graze all day long, right? We eat meals. So targeted calorie consumption within a certain window of time, ideally an eight hour period, can help dogs to sleep better and more deeply. They're less anxious during the day. Their digestion is better. There's so many health benefits to time-restricted feeding. I feel like the whole digestive process in all three of my dogs is so much better with this. So I feed my dogs um, around nine or 10 in the morning and then again around five in the afternoon. So that's the example of their eating window. If you have a sick or a senior or an underweight dog, I recommend feeding three larger meals in the eight hour window. So still giving them that eight hour eating window, but feeding them three times and a larger portion of food. So when Chipper was underweight and struggling with his cancer symptoms, that's how we were feeding him. He was getting three meals in an eight hour eating window and the 16 hours afterward were spent fasting. And most of that time is overnight sleeping. So it's really not that hard on the dog. If you have an average healthy dog, feed all the calories that your dog requires in one or two meals in the eight hour window. Dogs don't have to have two meals a day. Some of them do really well on one meal a day. You can play around with that. And then if you're, you have uh, an obese or overweight dog, I recommend feeding three smaller meals within the eight hour window. And the reason for that is feeding a smaller amount of food or less calories than your dog uh, requires to maintain their obese weight is easier if it's fed in three meals. So the dog feels like he's getting more, he can look forward to the meals, but there's less calories being given at each feeding. And again, within that eight hour window. So going a step further now and talking about the benefits of fasting for your dog. Veterinarians regularly recommend fasting for certain illnesses, such as reducing toxic side effects and improving the benefits of chemotherapy. Fasting is wonderful for acute vomiting and diarrhea. In fact, many dogs will fast on their own. Skipping a meal is a mini fast. If your dog doesn't want to eat for some reason, honor the wisdom of their body and don't force food. Don't run around looking for different ingredients. 
to make your dog eat something. Fasting is very natural and beneficial to dogs. Internal cleansing happens. Rejuvenation of the cells happens. It can lower inflammation in the body. It just allows space for healing. Once Chipper was up to weight, once he was a good, healthy 60 pounds again, I started fasting him one day a week to help with his cancer symptoms, and it was tremendous. Now, we did a broth fast for him, so I would cook chicken bone broth, and that's all he would get uh, during his eight-hour eating window, and it would be up to 12, 24 hours of actual fasting. Homemade bone broth is so much better than anything you could buy at the store, uh, aside from maybe a packaged bone broth. So not just chicken broth, but a chicken bone broth. And I think Fire and Kettle is one brand that makes a good product. Um, it is cheaper to make your own at home, though. And then water fasting is recommended for severe illness or GI distress. And I recommend that you work with your veterinarian if you're going to do a water fast just because of the severity of the symptoms that you're probably dealing with and to make sure that your dog is hydrated and safe to do that. And weekly fasting, like what we did for Chipper, is just one day a week, skipping meals during the day and then having a normal overnight and eating a normal diet the next day. And just as a side note, dogs should be of a healthy weight and have a good healthy appetite they should have their minerals, mineral reserves built up and not be stressed. They should be well hydrated before you consider fasting. So definitely do this with a dog that you feel has a strong constitution and uh, is in a good weight before you start the fasting process. Okay, so in conclusion, the two most important factors of health and lifespan and longevity in dogs are what you feed your dog and when you feed your dog. So what you feed your dog includes the diet you're already feeding. Take time to evaluate, pull out the nutrition label and really look at the ingredients. What is your dog eating day to day? What is making up? What are the, the raw ingredients that he is getting to build new cells in his body? Consider adding in live food toppers. I think that's beneficial for any dog, regardless of the diet that you're feeding. You can consider better diet options. So we talked about less processed foods. We talked about freeze dries foods. We talked about the um, dehydrated foods. And we talked about a homemade diet, which is not nearly as hard as you may imagine. You can also supplement the diet you are already feeding to improve it. And then when you feed your dog, positively affects your dog's metabolism and health, immunity, longevity, 24-7 food leads to obesity, boredom eating, picky eaters, poor gut health, so many problems, poor sleep, more anxiety. It's really not the best way to feed a dog. And then the body can work on other processes when it's not digesting. So these two things, I feel, make a tremendous difference in your dog's health. No matter where you are, you can start doing this today. Start soaking the kibble if you're feeding kibble and feed it within that eight hour window. And if you're ready to take the next step, start adding a little bit of those live food toppers to whatever meal you're already feeding your dog. And again, feed it within that eight hour window. And then take steps gradually from there as, as you feel it's in benefit with your dog. You know, if you see improvements and you wanna go further, maybe consider a less processed food, maybe consider trying a homemade diet. Maybe you feed it one meal and then the other meal is a, a processed food and just start from there and see where you go but i know you're going to see some tremendous health benefits as soon as you implement the strategies in this module and i can't wait to hear more from you about what's working and how your dog is doing so be sure to drop any q and a's and contact me reach out if you have anything uh, that you want to talk more about okay that's it for now thanks and i'll see you at the next module